contributing to the CEN census work and I'll talk a little bit of the background of that work and why it was really important that we started uh, this process to thank the advisor group I know there are many members here today who are in attendance uh, to my colleagues uh, Eve, Aki and Leah who have done this work and I think with any piece of work and particularly when it's new it requires a lot of um, energy, uh, passion to keep you going, agility to respond and we've really tried to do it in a way that has been responsive to the needs of our members has been supported by the advisory group, taken on board the points that they have made and something that's really going to be valuable. So I suppose just taking a step back, what we're trying to do is to, you know, share these findings with you today because this came through the um, AIMS strategic plan. You know, one of the things that we have sort of struggled with in the past is been able to advocate in a way as an advocacy organization in a way that really is evidence-based. And I think we've really come into our own recently and through your own engagement with us to be able to identify and discuss what community education is uh, from a really solid base. I think the challenge that we had before, particularly around uh, seeking funding for community education, which has been a longstanding issue, was that when we were going to uh, funders of the department, it was difficult for them to get a sense of community education. Now with the CEN census, we're being able to offer that understanding of community education, but on our own terms. It's not a top down, it really is a bottom up. The whole idea of uh, the CEN census is to get that mixed methods is through the discussion with yourselves. So thank everybody for, for being involved in all of that and for responding to the questionnaire, which we know was lengthy. But we really try to do it justice as well in terms of the brilliant analysis uh, that's been carried out by Eve and Aki and really taking forward the points that you have brought uh, with regard to the CEN census and making them come to life in this report. So as I say, like the actual report won't be launched until June. This really is for you to get uh, the first uh, sneak preview and understanding of the outcomes. And I think to create a bit of a space for discussion, you know, there's probably going to be a couple of gaps uh, because it was the first time that we did it. And we hope there'll be more organizations that are going to be part of future CEN census. Uh, maybe you'll have some recommendations of future research on how we can use this, how you can use uh, this research as well. So we're trying to give a space for that today. So the discussion sessions will be half an hour. You'll be in uh, your own little group to discuss it in more detail. And another thing maybe just to, to talk about is that we've even seen the benefits of pulling together evidence uh, on this work, on what's happening in community education, how it's funded, the learner cohorts who engage in other kind of provision. And it really has helped support uh, the Secure and the Mitigating Against Educational Disadvantage Fund. And it looks like there will be an additional fund as well. So that's through your own efforts as well of getting funding for community education. And so the key aspect of that is that groups can spend it in a way that they need, whether it's on non-accredited uh, provision, uh, stuff that their learners need. I think of trying to get a fund that is going to enable groups to be responsive to the learner needs, to be in keeping with their own ethos, uh, to really try and maintain a transformative uh, community education approach and having funding that's not going to stifle that and uh, I suppose reporting systems that don't uh, stifle that is also really important. So I suppose that's a really positive aspect of this. But really, when we set out to do, uh, obviously, the CEN census, we didn't know COVID would be around the corner. And I think we've learned a lot through this process. I think it has captured a moment in time that was really important. It has highlighted, uh, as we all know, the inequalities, educational inequalities. We know it's exacerbated educational disadvantage. So I think, you know, through your engagement and support of making this research come to life, um, it's happened at a time where we really need that evidence base. Um, so I suppose that's uh, some of the background of why this is, uh, why we carried out this research. It was the first time that we did it. We'll be continuing on and looking for ideas about how we do it in a really effective way. Um, so that will be the future uh, census. And one thing that we're trying to do in Aintis as well at the moment is look at the impact of COVID one year on. Uh, we're really conscious that um, groups have done an incredible amount. And it was great to be at the membership webinar last week as well when we you know, discuss some statistics that are out there with regard to the drop in participation rates, particularly for members of the traveler community, uh, what needs to happen. I suppose they're like high level statistics that are out there, but we really got underneath some of them to understand that you know, many groups did a huge amount to maintain that connection with learners. They offered non-accredited provision shorter courses because it was, as was more enticing for people to take up a short course, particularly at a time of uncertainty. So it was great to be able to engage with everybody last week and get a real understanding of statistics. So they were kind of the high level statistics that we offered this week, whereas this piece of research is a really thorough mixed methods piece of research that was carried out in such a 
authentic way and we really uh, and I guess was not to speak for my colleagues did our best to produce it in a way that's going to be useful for yourselves and really as part of the as with the thank you for that is having the space today for a really good discussion so um, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues in a minute but also I think it's important to hear from people who participated uh, in the study as well so um, we're delighted that Lee McCarthy from Shep who's also a member of the Aintis board is here today to describe his experience I mean Nobody wants to be filling out more questionnaires and forms, but you know we're really thankful that people participated um, in this research. So he's going to be giving you know, his experience of that. And I know like it's 21 years since the white paper on um, adult education and like just recently looking back at the um, chapter on community education. And so many of the issues still remain and it's absolutely essential that I think there is a time now to really make change. I think um, of having the evidence base, I think with the FEST strategy, the specific focus on the community education framework, we can address the issues around uh, the funding aspects. So really when we looked at the, this research, it is focusing on the non-statutory as in page 113 of the white paper, I'm sure everybody knows it already, it's the non-statutory community education organizations who are predominantly members of the uh, CEN, the Community Education Network, um, as part of AINTHUS. So that's really where the focus of this uh, research lies. And I suppose what we're trying to do is, you know, offer authentic, you know, uh, meaningful, useful knowledge that's going to be helpful to you. So we're interested in what you have to say about the research. Um, it's not published yet, so obviously everything that you say it have to be in keeping with the findings if you wanted something additional, but what it will do is give us an idea about recommendations, about future areas that we need to focus on with the CEN census as we broaden it out. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, we're going to be going to 20. I hope people will be able to stay. We want a lot of discussion. I uh, want to really engage. I know people have great expertise and will have brilliant insights and we're really uh, relying on your participation today. And so I'll hand over to my uh, colleague, Eve Cobain, who led out on this research, and then Aki will do a piece in regard to the findings. So Eve, if you'd like to do the wizardry of sharing the screen. <laughs> yeah, thanks um, so much. So just to give you, I suppose, a brief um, outline of how the session is going to work um, and the findings. Um, first, we're gonna go through a project overview, um, and then we'll look at the particip participant profile of those who um, actually engaged in the census. I know so many of you did, so we obviously hugely appreciate that. And that's what's made this research um, so successful. Um, and then we're look, we'll look also look at the courses and objectives um, that were, that were um, outlined in the census, as well as funding streams, um, before turning to look at the organisational impact of COVID-19. And Aki will, will explore that, um, as well as the community education responses uh, to COVID-19 and the learner perspectives, which were captured through um, many learner surveys across the year, um, before then finally looking at priorities for 2021. And between the, uh, the, the profile and kind of overview of the sector, we'll also have a brief kind of pause for, for dialogue and discussion on those findings. And then again, um, just at the end of the COVID-19 section. So as Neve um, has already said, um, we, we, we really wanted to have this, um, census as a kind of action out of the strategic plan and really the goal of that was to provide the evidence necessary to promote a thriving community education sector so that's something um, we very much hope um, we've made some progress towards and also we're very much looking for um, uh, your input on that as we kind of look to to kind of um you know moving towards further iterations of the census in the future um the, the aim was to provide factual insight about the sector um, by developing an evidence base that could be used to get, advocate for the needs of the sector. And as Neve mentioned, um, 2020 was a unique year, um, as also was 2021, and in that we really wanted to capture um, a picture of the sector in that year, um, which was ultimately marked by COVID-19. So it became really valuable um, and key that we would capture um, the impact of that, that crisis as well. So this graphic here just provides um, really an overview of all the, the kind of the, the facets of the research. So um, the main facet would have been the CEN census, which so many of you engaged in, 76 um, responses um, to the census, uh, many of those, most of those which would have come from the CEN, but we also appreciated um, CFA sharing that survey out um, to their groups as well. We also held 48 initial member consultations um, and those were largely kind of a response to the immediate impact of COVID um, as we were kind of 
looking at um, the kind of shocks to the sector um, back in about around this time last year and gathering data and feeding that um, into the department um, through um, the TES group as well. Um, and Neve was very active on that. Um, we also, as I mentioned, had um, a number of learner surveys which were captured um, through largely the FET Learner um, Forum and a large number of community education um, learners also responded to those surveys. So we have 192 survey responses from community education learners specifically in total as well. And that was really valuable and um, obviously in capturing um, that learner voice, which is so critical um, to hear how learners have been coping. And we'll speak a bit more about how learners have fared over time um, during COVID-19 as well. We also, um, we also held three focus group discussions, two with practitioners and one with learners. And those were held at different points across the year as well. And then finally, we held five practitioner interviews and those were an incredibly valuable source um, of information in terms of capturing, I suppose, the, the more, more nuanced um, impacts of COVID-19 that we couldn't quite capture in, um, in quantitative um, measures in the census. So just to give you a quick overview of um, the participant profile of those who, who did engage in the census this year, um, you can see that a large number of groups, um, 29 of the 76 groups, um, were from Dublin, and that does reflect our current membership in the into CEN. Um, and we're hoping um, that in future iterations that we will have um, a more kind of representative um, profile of, of the sector across Ireland. Um, but we also had a large number, um, as you can see, from Tipperary, Cork and Donegal as well. So largely um, the, the or, uh, organisations that were surveyed in um, the CEN census last year were small organisations um, with up to 10 staff. And many of these groups um, also um, were working with small groups of learners intensively. So you can see there that um, many groups were working with up to 50 learners and very few groups were working with 500 or above learners. Um, and this, I think, is a really interesting finding, um, something that we haven't really had to date. Um, you can see here that last year, um, that the number of females participating in community education is almost triple that of, of the males um, participating. Um, and I'm sure many of you will, will have um, many reasons as to why that might be, but I suppose some that we could think of, I suppose, is the flexible options as well as the childcare um, available in many community education settings. So I think that's a really important finding and it's something um, we might discuss a little more um, in a little more detail later. So I think this is another important piece um, around the profile of learners engaging in community education. And you can see here that um, there were huge, huge ranges of, of groups, social and economic groups um, engaging in community education, a really diverse um, set of learners um, that were engaging, um, particularly um, the unemployed and socioeconomically disadvantaged learners um, were, were found to be um, engaging pretty much across the board um, with community education organizations, but it was also serving um, people with a disability, lone parents, migrants and travelers. And these were, these were just some of the groups, some other groups were also mentioned. So in terms of the provision um, in 2020 and 2019, um, you can see that there were a really wide range of both accredited and non-accredited courses on offer. Um, and you can see also that there was you know, almost triple the number of non-accredited courses reported in this year. And there are a number of reasons, I suppose, why that might be. Um, as Neve mentioned, uh, many courses were set up as well in response to COVID-19. So groups really showed agility in, in their ability to adapt and to set up um, supports for learners, and many of which were, were non-accredited courses. So just in terms of the objectives, um, we, we designated a number of um, course objectives and asked uh, participants if they, if they were engaging with these objectives. And you can see um, that these are broken up in, in terms of both accredited and non-accredited provision. So um, in terms of accredited provision, you can see that employability and upskilling feature really highly there, um, although a, a lot of other objectives feature strongly as well. 
And then in terms of non-accredited provision, you can see that social inclusion, mental health and well-being and learning to learn um, life skills are all are very highly um, featured for, for those non-accredited courses. Um, this is another um, interesting finding, um, I suppose, from the census, which is that um, there were a, a large range of funding streams um, captured um, across nine government departments and other sources, um, particularly phil philanthropic sources, as well as learner fees. And then there were many, many individual sources um, recognised as well, some of those which also were government departments. Um, so yeah, that's just the list of, of the funding sources where they, were, where they were mentioned more than once. Um, in terms of unique funding streams, um, we were able to identify um, 22 groups with one funding stream and 25 groups with two funding streams. And then a large number of groups also um, had multiple other funding streams. So um, you can see here uh, three groups had 10 and um, one group actually had uh, one group had 10 funding streams. So um, I might just pause for questions now before I hand over to Aki. I realize that's a lot of information to take in and um, I'm sure you'll all have input and questions. So just open it out to the floor. Uh, yeah, just quickly, I was wondering if uh, um, sample size, like I know it's probably not uh, the focus of the thing, but you know, there was 76 responses, um, you know, out of a total of, I don't know how many um, providers in, uh, of community education. Um, across the country. I mean, is there, a st is there a statistical significance in terms of the finding that we can uh, stand over? That makes sense. Or maybe we don't want to do that either, you know? I was wondering. Perhaps, uh, perhaps I can answer this question. So my standard point is, is that, uh, first of all, our main purpose was to use descriptive statistics as an inferential statistics. And secondly, this idea of statistical significance is actually quite uh, arbitrary if you know about all the debate of by less than five percent of this kind of stuff. So at the moment, our focus is to uh, describe the data we have rather than making a particular inference over it. Um, of course, we could for future we could do you know, use a statistical uh, some kind of statistical test to see whether a particular hypothesis is significantly uh, statistically significant or not. But at the moment, uh, we first prioritized describing the data we have. Thanks, Aki. Yeah, and just to add to that as well, I think this is one of the largest, if not the largest, survey um, in terms of respondents of, of community education that we have in recent years. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it, can, it can be seen as significant for that reason as well. Thanks very much, uh, Liam, for your question, Aki. I don't know if you'd come back in. Uh, Liam, but then I'll just go to Hugh. Yeah, that's okay. well. Just to understand it, it's not so much that I, I think we want to make uh, make a statistical report about it. It's just that we do make generalized uh, recommendations, and uh, it's just uh, it, uh, is legitimate to make generalized recommendations. Is more my question. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is yeah about the question of whether the sample we have is really representative of the entire. Uh, uh, sector. And uh, my short answer is that's difficult to answer because, first of all, because we don't know that entire sector. We don't know the entire, uh, we don't have a data on the entire sector. That's why we organize this, this, this census. So this is certainly the first step to draw a bigger picture of the uh, uh, entire sector to make our findings uh, more representative. But still, um, Rather than just saying nothing, first we draw some uh, informative uh, aspects from the data we have. Not necessarily to, you know, to recommend and uh, generalize the, all the findings to the entire sector, but to make some info, make some informative to help to make to help policymakers to make uh, informative uh, decisions. Uh, we believe findings are still of some value. Thanks very much, Aki. Um, actually, my internet was unstable there, so um, I'll just uh, come back to Hugh, wanted to come in, and then to Stephen. Hugh, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I, I was just looking at the respondents, and maybe I missed it. Is there any reason why there was no respondents from Leitrim? I'm going to go to Eve for that. Thanks very much for your question, Hugh. 
Yeah, Hugh, no, no reason as far as I can tell, no particular reason. Um, I think the, the respondents from each um, sort of county do reflect generally our membership um, in, the, in those areas. And we did find we were successful, um, particularly in the counties where, where we have um, a larger number of members. So um, that's something that we're looking at. And we really would like to have participation across all counties um, in, in future. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Hugh and Eva. And I think maybe once now we have done it, like if you build it, they will come. Hopefully people will want to be involved in the next census because I know people were so busy and the year that was in it, it was challenging for people to take the time to complete it. And like Eve, I think rang maybe the 50 or 60 organizations encouraging people to do it and trying to help them with it. So I think when people will want to be part of it and hopefully with yourselves, you'll be, uh, you know, encouraging people for the next census to, to get involved as well. But thanks very much uh, for your question, Hugh. I'll go to Stephen and then to Camilla. Stephen, would you like to go ahead? Um, the question I was going to ask was, do we have any com compare anything to compare the data to, either historically from previous years or from other countries um, such as Scotland? or um, countries that may have done their own research. It's just if we have something to compare it to, it might give us a better perspective. Thank you, Stephen. Before I go back to Eve, I'm conscious of time, I would just ask Camilla to come in with her question and then go back to Eve, because I know Aki is also uh, itching to show part two of the presentation, but I'm glad you took a space. So um, Camilla, would you like to come with your question? And I'll go back to Eve, thanks. Yeah, well, it's just kind of a comment, really, just agreeing with what Aki is saying about represent, representation. I think it's clear to me that ANTIS aren't claiming that this is a representative sample and they're not drawing any inferential statistics. So I don't think we should be concerned about percentage representation. We don't know the size of the community education sector in Ireland. So I think this is perfectly legitimate to present the research as it's being presented. It's brilliant. Um, and I think the last research is obviously in my book. Sorry now to say that, but that is four years old, but there is over 200 edu community educators represented in that. And then before that, obviously the sowing the seeds and the more than just a course, but this is, yeah, definitely the most up-to-date that I'm aware of. It's brilliant. Thank you for doing it. Thanks a million, Camilla. And actually, if you want to put in a link to your book there, I mean, put it into the chat because it's a really important piece, uh, piece of research. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Stephen um, had a question there. So go back to yourself, Eve, and then we'll go straight into Aki. But it's great to see people are engaged with this. Eve, did you want to come? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, just on the question of is, is there anything we can, can compare this to internationally? Um, we have looked at some kind of research, um, particularly from Australia. They do um, they do a scan, an ACE scan um, or an ALE scan. Um, so I suppose that is one um, example of, of another country that is doing similar research. But I think um, you will find as well that we're actually quite well resourced in this area and quite cutting edge. Um, so, you know, a lot of countries haven't um, actually conducted this kind of, of research. Um, I think similar um, work is done in Scotland as well. Um, but yes, we we hope to be kind of um, the vanguard of this. And um, yeah, I think the, the Australian example is probably the best one to date. Great. Thanks, uh, Eve. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. And I'll just hand over to Aki now, um, who's going to share his screen and give you part two of the presentation. Is OK, Aki, if you want to go ahead? Sure, thanks. Can you all see the slides? Yes, perfect. Yeah. So now let me focus on the uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the community education sector. So first of all, the organizational uh, aspect. So 42 uh, respondents in the census mentioned that they were unable to deliver either some of their courses or any of their courses at all. And according to their, uh, the numbers they uh, submitted, uh, we estimated at least 2,337 learners were unable to transition to emergency mode learning. Similarly, we estimated based on the numbers reported, at least 4,100 learners were impacted by the cancellation of courses. And finally, 
2,226 runners were waitlisted or unable to take up courses. One group said that while we did transition to online, not all courses were suitable for this, so therefore did not go ahead. And I, uh, we, uh, uh, we guess this was especially for the case for the uh, hands-on practice based courses. And this is actually goes along with the findings from the uh, general fed sector as well. Also another respondent mentioned, at the beginning of 2020, our student numbers were high, but uh, COVID will impact on our 2020 to 2021 numbers. If we look at the uh, support, uh, the community education providers have uh, provided, and also what kind of uh, course uh, supports got more demand. If you look at the graph, so 36 uh, respondents mentioned additional support as a free support they offered. And also uh, 37 respondents mentioned the demand for additional IT support, free or otherwise, increased as the consequence of COVID-19, which makes sense because everything became remote learning. So IT was an essential part of uh, learning. Also, if you look at the uh, counseling, uh, 23 groups uh, mentioned uh, there was an increased demand for that. Family support, 20 groups mentioned as an uh, area of demand, uh, increase in demand. And the third thing, and the, this, is a kind, this is an interesting point. Uh, only five groups said that they provided a, five, uh, provided a free support for domestic violence services. However, certain groups mentioned that uh, there was an increased demand for uh, domestic violence services, either free or otherwise. Now, uh, if we look at what kind of impact the uh, COVID pandemic had on finances and income streams, there was a question to ask whether they experienced a funding cut at the time by the time of the census, and also whether they were anticipating a further reduction in funding or income. And if we look at the data, total 24 groups mentioned they already experienced funding cut by the time of the census. On the other hand, um, uh, 37 groups anticipated a further reduction in funding or income. So uh, the COVID had a uh, negative uh, impact on the finances and the income streams of education groups. Also, we looked at uh, what kind of experiences the practitioners of uh, community education uh, had. So when uh, respondents were asked how much they agree that practitioners receive training on, on-site provision during COVID-19 and on teaching uh, remotely. More respondents agreed that practitioners received training on face-to-face -face provision during COVID-19 rather than teaching remotely. This implies that uh, uh, community education groups had a more, had a better prepared, preparedness for a face-to-face -face learning, learning rather than uh, teaching remotely. Also, um, the mental health and the well being of practitioners were also highlighted as an uh, important issue. One respondent said, I, would like, I wouldn't like to underplay the effect on staff. It has been such a struggle. Actually, it was worse under level three than it was under level five because there are a fantastic amount of work going into achieving only these new things. And when it doesn't come off, you find you actually haven't got off after all that. In some cases, mental health supports were also in place for practitioners. Uh, while respondents said, we were extremely lucky because we have our own national mental health project. They have us online doing self-care program. 
Now uh, we are going to look at uh, what kind of perspectives learners had as a consequence of COVID-19. So generally we identify the difficulty from the from learner voice, the difficulty living with the pandemic and learning remotely. One lone parent learning nation, mental health and emotional fatigue. A learner born outside the island stated remote learning is harder than learning in the center. A learner with a disability stated while I am very happy to have this course delivered via Zoom, by an excellent tutor, it is much better to attend in person. So both from, both from uh, groups and from uh, learners, there was stated preference for face-to-face -face learning, although the COVID restrictions made it difficult or impossible. Uh, it is also important to highlight the vital role community education played for disadvantage and the burden of learners. One learner with a disability mentioned, I look forward to our class every week. This is very important for my mental ability to cope with cocooning. We also looked at the uh, long term effect of remote learning or COVID restrictions or the pandemic. So com we, com we made a comparison based on uh, the uh, learner survey we conducted uh, last June and the and, uh, surveys we conducted uh, across this academic year. And with respect to satisfaction with remote learning compared to the initial per period of the lockdown, community education learners satisfaction with learning at home decreased by 22%. Also, mental health uh, was also an uh, important issue. Compared to the initial period of the lockdown, uh, these learners reporting that their mental health had been affected by the COVID-19 crisis increased by 37%. And finally, in terms of motivation, compared to the initial period of the lockdown, community education learners reporting that they struggled with motivation or a lack of structure increased by 24%. So we can um, draw here that uh, we basically, the long-term effect of COVID had a more negative uh, implications for learners as uh, the pandemic and the restriction on. Finally, I'm going to conclude the presentation with the, uh, with the discussion on priorities for 2021. First was to address digital poverty. 67 census respondents said access to digital resources was either important or critical. 64 said digital literacy training for learners was either important or critical. And 61 said training for tutors in blended learning was either important or critical. Also, mental health supports were mentioned as priority for 70 respondents indicated that support for learner mental health and well being were either important or critical. Supporting social cohesion and outreach are also mentioned. 66 said promoting social cohesion was either important or critical, and 52 said outreach was either important or critical. And uh, as we uh, out, as we advocated in in another report that we discussed the uh, implications of mitigating against educational disadvantage. Funding um, in uh, in along this uh, context of the census, we also uh, would like to uh, renew the call for uh, another iteration of mind funding. And in that report, we identified several areas for further funding. But uh, uh, at the moment, I am going to stop the uh, presentation. Thanks very much, Aki. 
And I know people will probably have more questions um, as well. Uh, so it's much appreciated that uh, really uh, clear overview from yourself and Eve. I just want to hand over uh, to Liam McCarthy, uh, who participated in the CEN census, just to get your insights of being, um, you know, part of it and what it was like for you. So can I hand over to yourself, Liam? So Liam McCarthy uh, from SHEP and also a member of the INCAS board. If you'd like to just share your reflections, Liam, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Neve. Yeah, and I won't take too long if we're behind time. I mean, just uh, for say, I'd like to uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to participate. And uh, I think it's been, um, I, I suppose, seeing the the feedback is one thing to to you know participate from your in, individual perspective, but to see uh, sort of like a the commonality and uh, I don't know the widespread um, echoes back in the research. I mean, is both um, you know I suppose it it it, it affirms something. Um, and so pulling it together it was a huge achievement, just to say that to to Entis and to those involved in it. I mean, so it was a big effort in the context in which, where people are working from home. And I mean, all of the projects people are engaging with in the survey are also struggling. I think it's a huge achievement. So great, great to be involved and a credit to the achievement. So things that, that strike me um, um, from that was the uh, widespread commonality of experience. And, you know, uh, I coming from Cork, you see there was, uh, it's, it was nice to see the, 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 the peak of numbers um, from Dublin being the capital, but it's also nice to see the, the spread of uh, numbers from other places and hopefully over the coming while we'll manage to grow that. Um, just to say, you know, my question about the statistics uh, as a reflection, I mean, um, I, I got myself, well, I could get myself in hot water with that, but look, my, my sense of the, of the it is that it, like the, it's hugely valuable. I mean, uh, Neve and uh, some of the Entis team would know the efforts we've been making in Cork, like to see and uh, nationally to try and make sure the voice of community education is on, profiled all the time because it is something that could fall below uh, the radar. So it, to, to see um, a report like this, to, to, it's just so valuable to have it really. And uh, I know it's something that it will be iterative over time um, in terms of like a census. So, um, but you know, things that strike me, right, um, were uh, the, 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 the geographic spread, the embeddedness, the reach of, um, in terms of let's say, um, disadvantaged um, cohorts of, of um, people, the, the complexity all speak to me for the need for a unified voice. And um, I know that's exactly what the interests are about in, in, in this. And um, so, but like it just, it, 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 because it, it, I won't say fragmented is the wrong word, but you know, like they're so diverse and spread so widely. And there's so many of the groups, we, we, know, we, know, we don't know the size of the sector, but there was 76 here. I mean, it could, you know, it runs into a, a, a thousand or more groups across the country. Having a unified voice for that diverse sector is so important. And things, uh, things that I, other things and i'll finish with it, it, this bit right i, I feel that like the 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 learner voice is so important and actually seeing the um or forgetting that because I, you know i suppose i'm not a learner I'm a, I'm a provider so having that in the report i think is really important and seeing the the echo of the creative way all of the providers and the learners responded in the um pandemic is important but noting the voice of the learners there where there has been lost was quite a significant loss of participants right um, and it was quite a, 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 I think it was a, a sort of a deterioration over time as the thing lingered on so I think that voice in there is very important um, so they'd be the things that stand out, stand out for me um, it was uh, grateful to be involved and um, grateful to be here today to participate in the taking to the next step um, of the findings of the survey. So, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I hope I've spoken to with enthusiasm a bit, really, uh, to my part in it and uh, haven't complicated it in any way for anybody. So, thank you for the opportunity and uh, hope that's on the helpful end as opposed to uh, sending things anyway backwards. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 Liam. Thanks a million. And it is, it's, it's important that people who participate and spend their time uh, being part of this research are heard in the research process and can help us improve going forward. So I really appreciate your reflections on that. Uh, an interesting discussion um, about a range of things from funding to how we can do outreach in the future to reach those hard to reach people who are now even harder to reach. Um, the thing that I just want to to raise as well is I remember after the 2008 crash, um, Aintis 
made the decision to go to the government departments and ask how can we help and when we're looking into the future at the economic effects i think maybe it would be good to do the same thing and look at how can community education help to get that social inclusion back to get people back together again um, and also how can we prepare for the next pandemic <laughs> which the scientists are saying it's good this isn't going to be a standalone once off um, they're going to be more and we need to be prepared for it. Thanks very much, Stephen. And I think a good aspect of the CN census that we have the evidence of the impact that community education can make, the groups that have been most <laughs> impacted by the pandemic and how community education really works to engage uh, learners, marginalised learners. So I think having that will be helpful. And as was now, we are at the table every Friday. So, you know, as, as we were talking in our group, like, we have the, having the evidence, having the CEN census and the facts, but also being able to carry out our representative role in a more authentic way by knowing exactly what's happening with yourselves through engaging through the weekly webinars, through having this information research has been really helpful for us in our advocacy work. So I think we're in a really good position to do just what you're saying, like, like how community ed um, uh, can help. And also I think we need to be bold and ask what community ed needs and to be really clear at making, I mean, we have the, uh, the med funding but that's not well it has to be determined for this year I mean it's not a firm fixture within that but I think we really need to build the capacity of groups to you know be bold and ask and I think that's something that we've learned ourselves over the last year um, particularly when funding will be tightening they can't uh, you know we can't have the same thing that happens to community education every time um, there's a financial crash so we have to prevent that so I think having the evidence base having engaged members is going to be really part of that I don't know if anybody wants to come in or anybody from um, the AINTHUS team. I can't see any of the hands up uh, if anybody wants to come in and give a bit of a sense. Um, if any of my colleagues want to maybe just unmute yourself and, and come in because I can't see everybody there. I might uh, maybe just Suzanne. Oh, perfect. Oh, I, I'll go to Suzanne and then Katie. Sorry, you were bang on <laughs> at the same time. But I just, so I'll go to Suzanne first. Thanks a million. Thanks, Neve. And Stephen um, gave uh, a bit of an update from the group, but just a couple of other questions that came up that would be interesting to ex explore um, were around the funding cuts and how and why groups were caught and what funding streams were they and what was the reason behind it and was it to do with numbers and so on. So looking into that in a little bit more depth, um, it was felt would be useful. Um, the question of outreach is is com is coming up a lot, um, and then the, you know highlighting that the role of community education in um, promoting solidarity, social cohesion, and so on. Um, and the another question that came up was just around the impact of. Uh, are on um, particularly around accredited provision um, in terms of work experience um, wh where people have to work experience as part of their their um, maybe QQI awards and so on and how that um, works for groups and just that maybe the long term impact um, on um, learners and, and communities um, around not being able to engage in, in our participation in work experience. Um, so there were just a couple of the, the, the comments and questions that came up. Great, thanks a million, Suzanne. And I think honing in on specific areas is something that we could look at doing, whether we're going to do a paper in the future on this. I think the point around funding and digging deeper to understand those differences is, is, is needed. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that um, and all the different areas that you've said there, something that we need to think of for a future census or what we can do with the current information that we have as well from this census. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Katie, you were both in at the same time there, so it's <laughs> over to yourself. William, yeah, I just wanted to give some feedback from our group um, and I know our, our colleagues have put in a huge amount of work to this. So it was just to congratulate um, the team on this piece of research and how needed it is in terms of having uh, the quantitative uh, research piece and how useful it will be for members on the ground in terms of, of advocating for their centres. Um, I guess one of the big issues that came up was around the digital divide. Um, and just the future of blended learning and how that might look within the community education sector. So I guess most, most some of our discussions looking at how we can really support members to disseminate uh, the findings. And I think that's something we talked a lot about. And um, so how we can do that from a national organization. But I think overall, just 
how needed it is and I guess great excitement to be able to read the full report uh, as well but just how needed it is and how great it is to see that collective voice um, from the community education sector and 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 some of those issues uh, that have been identified as well. Great, thanks very much, Katie. And we'll have notes from all the um, discussion groups as well that we will. It'll help us, you know, in terms of finalising the report and looking at uh, future um, CN census as well. I know a couple of people have to go. I think I have two minutes. That was pretty good. We made it there at the end. And I think if anybody. I mean, there's a lot to take in, just kind of reflect on the research, if there's gaps, if there's things that you think would be helpful for, to yourself, just send them in like um, to Eve, if that's all right, Eve, I'll nominate you uh, for that, if that's okay. If you have any comments, uh, questions, we will let you know when the, the final like launch of the uh, report is going to be. As I said, I think, you know, we're, we're at the table now, there's a real possibility for us to address the long-standing issues like at a policy level around community education. I think having the evidence base has been absolutely vital for that. Um, we are looking at doing like a one year on COVID-19. I mentioned just briefly at the start um, of the webinar of looking at the impact on, on educational disadvantage because while at the start of the pandemic when we were chairing the Mitigating Educational Disadvantage Working Group, I mean, there was a huge amount of support and everybody's really engaged. And I think we need to reinvigorate and highlight the issues because just because there was the med funding and different things that happened doesn't mean the issue is gone. So we're trying to keep that on the agenda. So we'll be in touch around what we're going to do um, around that um, because we know that there's going to be a huge amount that has to be carried out to address the impact of COVID and the points that have been raised around outreach. I mean, if ever there's a need for outreach, I know Stephen has brought it up and... and um, Suzanne was saying it there in her feedback as well, something that we're really conscious of. And for that to be funded, I mean, somebody has to do that work. So that's something that we know is coming back from our members. And like our advocacy work is, you know, dependent on knowing what's needed on the ground. So do come, you know, to the webinars, you know, engage in the CEN, let us know what's, what's happening. And I think we need to, you know, I think we've come very far in our, this is the research work that we have done. So just to Command. I mean, Eve started, led out on this. That was when she started in eighth. It's like, here's a CEN census right now. Let's do this. And so to come to this point of have something that people are really valuing and reflective. So that's really uh, your work, um, Eve and Leah. And then Aki coming in and providing brilliant expertise on statistics as well has been, you know, really helped to round out um, all of this. And obviously, thanks to the advisory group, we've had so many discussions we were just saying there to get to this point it all looks easy at this stage but it was quite complex so really appreciate all the expertise from everybody and for people taking the time um, as Liam had said of engaging in this it's really appreciated so I think this is the first uh, step in this we'll be continuing on we'll have a census uh, next year hopefully it'll be something like a funding thing that people want to be involved in hopefully people who are you know receive the med funding Finding Aethis and the CN, I think we've, from hearing people, we need to uh, build on the power of the collective and the support uh, that we've been able to offer each other each week. So I suppose encourage people, and I'll barely be happy I said that, encourage people to become members, but it's not about that. It's about, you know, creating a strong united voice. And that was something that Liam was saying in his input as well. So I don't think I forgot anything there. I hope not if any of my colleagues, want to come, the slides will be available uh, and there will be a uh, questionnaire about just give us a response about this webinar and how we can improve. So I want to thank everybody, um, all my colleagues and the Aethis team and yourselves for engaging today. Really appreciate it. And we'll let you know when the big fancy launches, but you got the sneak preview. You got to see all of it, uh, which is important. That's the most important thing for us. That was your uh, research. So I will close today and thank everybody for participating and see you all soon. Thanks a lot.